I'm going to tell you about uh, the work that we've been doing for the last two, pretty much two years at Coursera, um, about opening up access to education to um, anyone around the world with an internet connection. So the project that uh, we did actually started out as a Stanford University project back in the fall of 2011, where together with my uh, colleague and co-founder Andrew Ng uh, and a number of our colleagues, we tried an experiment of taking three graduate courses in computer science and opening them up for everyone around the world to take for free. These were pretty advanced courses, so we were expecting an enrollment of maybe a few hundred or a few thousand students in each one of them. But within a matter of weeks, each of those had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more from 160 plus countries. And that was to us a real revelation because it illustrated that education had reached that point where technology allows us to provide an education to anyone at effectively a zero marginal cost per student. And the opportunity of that was too large for us to pass up because we all know that education is the great equalizer in opening doors to opportunity for people who would otherwise be completely stuck in, in, a, no, in a dead end job or without any opportunity to provide for themselves and their families. And so after a little bit of deliberation in the fall of 2011, in January of 2012, we spun this out of Stanford um, as a separate effort that whose goal was to work with multiple top universities to take some of the best uh, content from the best teachers and make it available to everyone. We launched in April 2012, so just a little over two years ago, uh, with four university partners, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan. Um, we had 200,000 students left over from the Stanford courses in the fall and 37 courses. So fast forward um, two years, and this is a recent screenshot. Uh, we have over 7.7 .7 million learners from every single country around the world, with the exception of North Korea. Um, we have 657 courses from 109, actually as of this morning, 110 university partners. Um, and we offer courses across the range of disciplines. I'll give some numbers about how much education we've actually offered a little bit later um, in, in the talk. So I'm going to divide this talk into three parts, the what, the who, and the why. Um, the what is what are these online courses? What is the course experience like? Um, the who is who's taking them and, uh, and what are the implications of that? And the why is coming back to why we decided to embark on this journey in the first place. So um, the what, uh, as I mentioned, we have at this point 110 university partners. Um, you can see some of them here. There are uh, about uh, half of our uh, universities are top US universities that all of you will likely have heard of. Uh, universities like, and we've already talked about Stanford and Princeton and Penn and Yale and Columbia and Duke and University of Washington and University of um, Michigan and many, many others. Others. Um, there's also um, a, a comparable number of top non-US universities from Europe, from Asia, from Australia, from Latin America, from Canada, and so on. And we're now able to offer courses taught natively in, I think, eight different languages and growing. Um, the courses began as computer science, but we're definitely not doing just that anymore. You'll see some examples later on in the talk. Um, this is a slightly old chart, but you can see that uh, we offer a, a, a very large percentage of courses in arts and the humanities, in everything, including philosophy, global challenges, sustainability, astronomy, um, uh, ethics, business, medicine, um, civil rights, and many, many other topics. So what are these courses like on the inside? So first of all, and I think this is one of the several big distinguishing factors from, say, the MIT Open Courseware effort, which really was the precursor of a lot of this work, is that these are not just static courseware that anyone can access and um, you just watch some videos. In addition to the video content uh, designed specifically for online consumption, there's also a tremendous amount of interactivity both with the course material and between 
between learners and other learners. So where do you get um, interaction with the course materials in a way that actually gives you a meaningful assessment of your ability to do this work, to apply this work in a meaningful way? So the problem, of course, is that if when you have 100,000 students, you don't usually have 5,000 teaching assistants. And so who's going to grade the work of all of these students? Um, and so there's two different uh, paradigms that we're employing. The first, of course, is computer-based grading, which ranges from your good old multiple choice um, to short answer grading. You can grade computer programs. You can grade computer models, including Excel spreadsheets. You can grade math expressions. So you can do some pretty interesting work today graded by a computer. Our instructors, in fact, have been able to apply this in a very creative way. So here's one example course that I really love. It's by uh, Professor Mike Schatz from Georgia Tech, who taught, who taught a course called Introductory Physics with Laboratory. How do you teach a lab class when your students are in Bangladesh and Ghana, and the vast majority of them will never have access to a lab? So what Mike did is he had the students do the experiments in their own environment with objects that are just found there, like balls and tables and so on and so forth, and had them videotape the experiments with their cell phone and upload them up to the, to the server. Now, how do you grade that work when you have no idea what the mass of the ball is or the friction coefficient of the table? So what Mike did is he developed image processing software that tracks the trajectory of the ball, computes accelerations, velocities, and so on, and computes the ground truth relative to which the student's work is graded and therefore is able to give them instantaneous, meaningful feedback about whether they did the experiment correctly. Now, the interesting thing about what Mike did is that he teaches a similar class at Georgia Tech where the students do have access to a you know, top-of-the-line lab, but he discovered that the Georgia Tech students really prefer to do their experiments in the wild as well. So now all of the Georgia Tech students are also doing the experiments in you know, basketball courts and whatever and are coming to class to describe how they did the experiments and getting feedback from their peers, and I'll come back to that in a little bit as well. Now, of course, uh, computer grading will only take you so far, at least today. I'm an AI expert by training, and I can tell you that AI is not quite at the point of grading open-ended, uh, critical thinking style work like essays or designs or so on and so forth. And so how do you do grading for that? Well, um, what we did with that is we developed a pipeline called peer grading, where students grade the work of other students relative to a grading rubric that is uh, provided by the instructor. So the students submit their work, they get the grading rubric, and then they provide feedback to five of their peers, and then they also go back and grade their own work as well using that same grading rubric to give them an understanding of what they did well and what they could have done better. And it turns out that for well-designed grading rubrics, this is actually um, a very reliable method for grading, as in it correlates beautifully with what TAs would have given that same piece of work. And that furthermore, students tell us consistently that they learn as much or more from evaluating and critically assessing the work of their peers as they would have done um, by doing the work, as they did from doing the work themselves. And that, I think, is a really important aspect because it really ties in the social aspects of learning with um, the online component. So people are actually participating in this as a collaborative experience rather than um, just themselves with a computer. Now, it turns out that uh, peer grading really opens the door to doing, the kind, to doing a whole range of assignments at scale that you would not think could possibly be done in one of those massive open online courses. So for example, um, here is a design class from the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania. It's an eight-week project class. In each of those weeks, the students submit progressively more and more advanced designs, um, starting from a concept, uh, a, a, a prototype, and finally an artifact, and they get feedback back from five of their peers at each, one, at each point in the process. And the amazing thing is that these students produce artifacts that are easily, um, the best of them, are as good as what uh, the instructor sees from his Wharton students, or so he tells us. So this is an example of the kind of experiential work that you could do at scale. Here's another example of, um, an at scale, of the use of this grading to do something really innovative. 
This is an interesting class. It's a social psychology class from Wesleyan University. Um, what's interesting about it is that it's the largest class we've ever offered. It had 250,000 students, which is kind of interesting when you think about the fact that Wesleyan is a small liberal arts college, and the instructor typically teaches something like you know, 15, 20 students when he teaches on campus. So um, that final project for that class was called the Day of Compassion. The students had to pick a to, to live their lives for one day embodying the virtue of compassion, analyzing it using tools of social psychology, and write up their results that would be graded by peer grading. Several thousand students completed that final project. 700 got a perfect score on the peer grading. The one that was highest ranked here is Balesh Jindal, who actually got as a grand prize to fly to Stanford and meet the Dalai Lama. Um, Balesh is an Indian physician, and her final project was to try and do something about the problem of sexual violence against girls and women in India, a very endemic problem. Um, so she picked a school nearby that had 2,000 girls from low-income families. She went, got them together in groups, ex explained about sexual violence, what it is, identified several dozen cases of girls that had been subject to sexual violence and is now giving them pro bono consulting in her clinic for free. Um, uh, together with their mothers. And she was so excited by what she'd done that she also convinced several of her colleagues to do the same at other schools nearby. So think about the impact that this one professor, Scott Plaus, um, has had relative to what he would have had if he'd continued teaching his, his class at Wesleyan. This is one story out of 700 that got a perfect score, many of whom I think are probably almost as compelling as this one. So the last piece of the learner experience in, um, in this effort is that this, when the learner completes the class successfully, as they did here, they have the opportunity to basically earn a certificate. And um, they sign up. The certificate has, uh, this, they sign up for a, an option that we call identity verified track or signature track, where the student effectively signs their work using keystroke biometrics. And I'm happy to take questions on that later, so that we know who the learner is. Uh, we can identify that they are they when they log into the platform and do the work, and at the end we can give them an identity verified um, uh, certificate that they can then use in many cases to achieve employment opportunities. So putting all these together, we've actually been um, able to now um, more recently announce an even larger unit of learning than just individual courses. So here, for example, are what we call specializations. These are multi-course uh, sequences with a capstone project at the end. So our second largest class is actually the Android programming class from, uh, from the University of Maryland. It's a joint specialization with Vanderbilt. Um, that had 206,000 learners signing up, several of whom, the class just ended a, a few weeks ago, have already told us that they found jobs by virtue of taking this class. And what's nice about this is that the sequence ends with a capstone project, and Google has actually sponsored the capstone and is going to highlight the top five apps in the Google Play Store, which of course is the dream of any Android developer. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the learners who are taking this, um, these courses. So first of all, a little bit of statistics. This is a couple of months old now. There's been about 7,500 years of video watched on the platform, 164 million quizzes submitted, um, 3.5 million peer-graded assessments, these are a lot of work usually, and uh, over a million course completions. Um, those numbers are now already a fair bit higher than that. So what do you do with numbers like that? So I was originally invited here by Vinod to talk about big data, and I told him I wasn't going to talk about big data, I was going to talk about education, but here's a place where big data and education meet. Because when you have 164 million quiz submissions, you can learn an awful lot about human learning. You can learn about what interventions work in the macro sense, like if, what motivates students, for example, but you can also learn, at it on the, uh, you can learn about it in the micro scale, so in the context of a particular course, which elements of the course are working working and which aren't, which of course is a radical departure from what happens in your traditional classroom where the only time that I as an instructor had visibility into what's going on in my class is at the end of the quarter when I saw the final exam and I said, darn it, 
I thought I taught that better. Um, and here you have this amazing visibility. So for example, you can look at the distribution of wrong answers to one of your questions. This is one such example. And you can see that there's this huge cluster of students up there, that all of who made the exact same mistake. Now, when two students of a class of 100 make the same mistake, you would never notice. But when it's 2,000 students, it kind of jumps out at you. And so you can go in and figure out what was the cause for the mistake. And now every student who comes onto the platform and submits that answer doesn't just get a generic you're wrong, but actually gets some targeted feedback that helps them learn better and fix their mistake. So what, one other interesting aspect about, um, about the work that we're doing is the distribution of learners that we have around the world. From the very beginning, we were very much a global effort. Um, we're now only a third in the United States. Um, Two-thirds are in the rest of the world, and a third of our learners are from emerging economies, and not just the BRIC countries, but much more broadly. And you'll see some of those stories soon. You already heard Balesh's story, and I'll tell you one at the end as well. Now, I'm going to preempt this question because it's one that uh, the media has hammered us a lot. In every truly disruptive effort, you're always going to have uh, naysayers who find something to pick on. So the thing that the media has latched onto is the so-called completion rates in our courses. It is, in fact, true that of the people who enroll in one of our courses, about 5% actually complete it. And people say, well, if you had that kind of completion rate in your typical college class, that would be a travesty, which is true. What they don't understand is that the act of signing up for one of our courses for free, remember it's free, is analogous to putting a little X in the college catalog saying, that sounds like an interesting course. I might drop in on that and see what it's like. So how many people of those actually complete a class? So just to sort of um, look at this, what, it, what usually happens of the people who sign up only half of them even bother showing up on the day that the class begins because it's now a month since they signed up and they're now doing something else. Of the ones that show up, half of them realize that this isn't the class that they were looking for. They thought that that astrobiology class was about UFOs and it was going to show them clips from the X-Men. And no, it's like a real science class and that's very disappointing to them, so they drop out. Um, and so most of them, you know, so there's a whole bunch who drop out in the very first week. And then there's a whole bunch who treat this as if it was a PB documentary, which means they just watch the videos, they never submit a single assignment, they don't intend to submit a single assignment. All of these count against their so-called retention rates. So a more appropriate metric is of the people who actually intend to complete the class, how many complete the class. And so if you actually look at the average completion rate, as I said, it's 5% overall. Among learners who are committed to completing the class, that is, they say that in a survey about two weeks into the class, the completion rates are well over 60%. And if they then also put in a little bit of extra skin in the game and sign up for that verified certificate, which costs $50, so not a lot of skin in the game, completion rates go up to close to 90%. So that's a very different picture from that 5% number that the media loves to harp on. Now, one other aspect that I want to focus on is that retention is helped by intent, but it's also helped by community and social structures. And so one of the things that we've put in place is a network of learning hubs that um, have, uh, where people get together in everywhere from US embassies, New York public libraries, and a variety of other places around the world once a week to study together. And that also increases retention rates to north of 70%. So the final um, piece of, uh, in terms of uh, the, the who is this last note that uh, one of my favorite quotes. What does it mean to college education? We are often asked that. One of my, quotes, one of my favorite quotes is, college is a place where professors' lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. So what, is it, what implications does online education have in this case? Well, maybe we should stop lecturing at our students. Maybe what we should do is have them get that content delivery outside of class via this online flexible model and then come into class and actually engage actively with each other via active learning and problem solving. And it turns out that when you do that, these results are pretty typical. You take the failing part of the distribution in your traditional class and you move it over to the passing range. 
So most of the students who are likely to fail now pass the class. And that's a pretty important thing uh, when we have these huge failure rates in places like community colleges. So really what this uh, model does is it provides us with a different way of doing education. This is an observation by Christian Turwish from the Wharton Business School, who basically said that education is a trade-off along a Pareto optimal curve um, between faculty productivity, the number of students taught in an hour, versus the students' learning outcomes. Large lecture hall, reasonable productivity, not great learning outcomes. Personalized instruction, great learning outcomes, terrible productivity. He says that these MOOCs really provide us with a new frontier. You can take, and we, we, it's up to us where on that frontier we want to be. You can either increase productivity, um, which, is, which is taking the same quality of that we get in a lecture and move it over to the right and offer it not to hundreds, but to hundreds of thousands of learners. Or you can take the same amount of time that faculty currently invest in teaching and delivering content and instead do blended learning, and you don't improve productivity, but you improve learning outcomes. And so it's up to us how we want to use it. So I'm out of time, and so I'm going to skip past a few of the last slides and just make a couple of final points, if that's okay. Um, so stepping back and saying why are we doing this and why is this important. Um, I'm going to use somebody else's words uh, for this because no one can say it quite like Tom Friedman who wrote up this effort back in May 2012 and said that big breakthroughs are what happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. So desperately necessary are some of these statistics. The worldwide demand for higher education is projected to expand from 97 million in 2000 to 262 million in 2025. And there's no way in developing countries to build up capacity for that number of students in that short of a time frame. Um, we, there's just, you can build buildings, but you can't populate them with qualified instructors. Um, so for example, in India, they're going to have to train hypothetically a million instructors in order to meet the demand that India needs in order to achieve um, that amount of higher education. And the situation in Africa is considerably worse even than that. And so, um, so what, have we, what are we doing? Let me skip past the US example and just go directly to the last one. Every one of those learners that is not reached is an example like Charmin. Sharmeen Shahabuddin from Bangladesh um, lives in a society where selling girls for serv in servitude is a very common practice. Sharmeen did not like that practice, um, and so she convinced a friend to run away with her so that they could um, open a bakery and have an independent life. They tried to open a bakery, but neither of them were very successful businesswomen. And so they were barely making enough to, to, to exist. In fact, they weren't making enough to exist. So Charmaine started by taking a pen course on uh, microeconomics. She continued to take a course from Michigan and then took a whole bunch of other courses, one after the other, to learn how to become a successful businesswoman. A few months later, after having done that, she managed to increase their monthly income in the bakery from 700 to $5,000, which is enough not just to support her and her friend, but seven women total, all of whom she managed to save from a life of being sold into servitude. So when we make education available for free, we're basically enabling women like Charmaine to make a better life for themselves as well as many others. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take one question. Do I see a hand raised? Yes. Is it for profit or is it non profit? And then what's the business model? <laughs> I like the free part. Okay, I like the free part too. It's, um, it's a for profit. We're, we're a venture backed company, not by Kosla, but when. <laughs> Um, and, uh, we but wish we had back to you. <laughs> uh, well, there might be, we could talk about that. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Um, we are a social entrepreneurship company, which is a growing breed. We're not the only ones to be a, a commercial company with a social mission. 
Um, in terms of what the business model is, it's a free education, that's our mission. Credentials um, cost money. We talked about the verified credentials costing something like $50 on average. It's purely optional. People have access to the education, irrespective of whether they sign up for the verified credential. And furthermore, because of the mission, we have a financial aid program, which is basically a fee waiver, which means that if you are a learner in Africa that really can benefit from the credential but can't afford the $50, which many people in Africa Africa cannot. You just fill out a one-page application. We basically waive the fee. In Africa, about 60% of our learners are on financial aid, and that's totally fine with us. Thank you, Daphne. Okay. Thank you.